Tanner, I'm, I'm, I'm up and running. Everybody should be seeing the, um, the it says truck empty backhaul analysis um, PDF or the, the image. Okay, great. Um, I'll just uh, hang, hang on for a second. Let's make sure everybody gets it first before. Has anybody, has anybody not gotten the PowerPoint or not received the link yet? This is Vince. I haven't. Okay, good, good. Okay. This is Lynn. I haven't got it either, but I've been having computer problems today. It's Virginia. I don't have it either. But. Okay, well, I just sent it out, so it may be... Um, uh, yeah, I just got it. Okay, okay. Okay, Tanner, why don't you go ahead and get started just so that we can um, stay back on track, so... Okay. All right, sounds good. Um, so Ed Hutchinson with Florida Department of Transportation uh, had identified that um, we might need to quantify the degree of truck empty backhaul, um, primarily at our border uh, Wayne Motion Station uh, locations. Uh, we have about 30 wind sites across the state, um, and so we did a, a comprehensive analysis uh, to quantify uh, what we're seeing as empty trucks out there uh, in our state. Uh, we had received anecdotal findings that uh, it could have been anywhere from 60 to 75 percent of all trucks leaving the state were empty. Um, and as we've analyzed our wind data, that is uh, not necessarily the case. So, um, I'm moving on to uh, slide two, the study objectives. And we needed to first define truck empty backhaul and to know what we're actually seeing with uh, the numbers as we observe empty trucks uh, at our wind locations. And so to do this, we had to develop a new methodology uh, to quantify uh, this. And uh, lastly, we looked at um, factors to help explain uh, truck empty backhaul uh, and see if we can find any um, recommendations to help solve uh, or at least provide uh, some policy guidance. So that was the motivation, slide three, is uh, to systematically quantify uh, truck empty backhaul. And our the Florida um, freight mobility and trade plan as well as the motor carrier system plan, both identify uh, empty backhaul as a uh, issue for the state. And it's also codified in Florida Statute 334 um, that this is an issue that we need to address as a state. So that was some of the motivation uh, to conduct this uh, analysis. Uh, slide four goes into the uh, definition of truck backhaul. Um, as a return movement of a truck from its destination to its point of origin. Well, as we see with um, our data, that's not necessarily the case in all cases. It could be an empty backhaul. It could be an empty head haul. Um, so we just needed to state up front that what we're seeing is the number of empty trucks at a given site at a given time. Um, so this is quantifying what we're seeing as empty trucks. We can't necessarily state if that's empty backhaul or head haul. So on slide five, uh, we start to outline the methodology. And you know, I have a, a question back on slide four. Yes. Are you finding that when you're doing the, the study, this backhaul question, is it very based on what part of the state they're in or out? Like for instance, do you have more of this empty backhauls coming from Miami, or are they coming out of Pensacola, or is there some regional nature to this? There is, yes. And uh, slides 8, 9, 10, um, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, there are intra-regional uh, patterns that, that we've identified, as well as patterns at the state uh, borders. Um, and they're different whether or not you're on I-10 or 75 or 95. But I, I will get into that here in just a second, Bruce. 
Okay, I moved to slide five, by the way. Okay. So the first thing is to identify which trucks we need to focus our study on. And as postulated, class nine is uh, the focus, as those are typically the uh, long haul uh, movements. Um, we found that in our data um, from 2015 through um, quarter three of 2017, for all uh, 30 sites, 63% of all trucks are class nines. So we then did a, a very quick analysis of the gross, average gross vehicle weight per unit length. And this was just to establish a benchmark uh, to know the reasonableness of our findings uh, in, in steps three and four, respectively, uh, of this analysis. So. Um, Basically, this uh, average gross vehicle weight per unit length uh, identifies the direction of travel, which has the greatest freight flow by weight. Um, and then we really get into the full analysis uh, in step three. First, it was easy to identify uh, the empty and full trucks. And, and I'll state that we have per vehicle record WIM data. So we don't bin or have 15 minute time periods of uh, data that just average out uh, for, for a given time period. Uh, we can do that, but we have uh, very granular data that we were able to analyze. And so that per vehicle record in your wind data is uh, essential for uh, this analysis. But with that, it's easy to identify the empty trucks as being less than 40,000 pounds. Uh, and mind you, this was focused on class nines. So about the time that we were um, identifying, you know, in our literature survey, uh, what other folks had identified as an empty truck, uh, we, we had some findings from a, a parallel uh, truck platooning study that we were doing here in the state of Florida that the trucks involved in that were class nine, five axle, uh, empty reefer trucks. So as a brand new Volvo cab, and a uh, brand new uh, empty reefer trailer, uh, but with full diesel tanks and full reefer tank. And that came to be 34,160 pounds uh, without the driver. So that gave us a, a good benchmark that, you know, up to 6,000 pounds some odd uh, of cargo um, doesn't necessarily uh, equate to a, a service load or payload. So. We were comfortable uh, identifying uh, empty as less than 40,000 pounds and full um, more than 60,000 pounds. And although uh, we have, it's widely understood, 80,000 pounds is maximum uh, vehicle weight, we do have uh, legislation here in, in Florida that allows a sealed container to be up to 100,000 pounds. Um, and then the next... Uh, Step four on slide six is really where we were able to identify out the cubed out trucks versus the partially empty trucks. And so cubed out, you can think of that as balloon freight or a uh, light commodity that the limitation is um, you can't fit anything else in that trailer. So uh, given this example on the screen, uh, gross vehicle weight of 53,000 pounds, uh, that's fairly evenly distributed between axles uh, three and four. Uh, we had looked uh, at doing the average of two and three versus four and five, uh, but when it came down to it and doing some spot checks on the per vehicle record data, it really is that difference between axles three and four to know if it's evenly distributed or not. And if it's 53,000 pounds or you know, less than 60,000 pounds, and it's evenly distributed, there's a good chance that that is cubed out. Um, alternatively, uh, if we're looking at something that's 58,000 pounds, um, but most of that weight is on axles two and three, or in, in the case of the analysis, axle three, if that weight is um, distributed more over axle three than axle four, we can call that a partially empty or partially full, however you want to look at it, um, where most of the cargo is over 
axle three. So there's room for additional cargo um, in that tractor or in that trailer. And so this is the area where we could start to lump partially empties with the empties and the cubed out with a full. So that gave us our um, weight distribution methodology for this uh, empty backhaul analysis. And slide seven is a flow chart to describe um, what I just mentioned. The one other uh, kind of caveat, if you will, is that um, you could have the scenario where the trailer um, is equally distributed between axles three and four, but it's still less than 60,000 pounds. And that could be a case where the cargo has to be loaded in such a way that um, it has empty volume of, as you go up. So maybe there are 55 gallon drums of uh, hazardous material that you can't stack on top of each other. Yes, there's additional cargo carrying capacity, but this would be considered um, cubed out because as per loading instructions or uh, the nature of the cargo, you can't fit anything else back there. So there's always going to be that caveat as well. And then on slide eight, uh, this is kind of briefs the analysis. We had a uh, hundred million records that we um, processed. Uh, we did a data validation, eliminate some of the errors. So um, if a vehicle was moving too fast or it was too light or uh, it was over length uh, for uh, as per our uh, WIM uh, decision tree, uh, we removed those uh, errors, so we're working with a, a clean data set. We had to use uh, SPSS for the analysis since uh, we had so many records. Um, and we did limit our analysis to the uh, interstate locations where we had WIM sites. Um, and then we did a cross-check with uh, TransSearch and FAF to uh, understand generally the reasonableness of our findings. And uh, they fell in line with each other, so we felt pretty comfortable. Um, generally, a statewide number that we had seen with uh, the TransSearch analysis was about 44% of trucks statewide could be empty. So that's just a, a kind of a spot check, if you will. Slide nine. Uh, starts to identify the findings. So, as mentioned before, uh, anecdotally, we were expecting anywhere from 60 to 75 percent of uh, all trucks being empty, especially at the border sites. Well, per our analysis, we found that um, trucks leaving this state, uh, so I-10, 75, 95, uh, it ranged between 30 and 50 percent leaving the state were empty, a much smaller number for those coming into the state. Um, is about 15 to 20% coming into the state were empty. So as I mentioned before, we f found differences between uh, that kind of imbalance or uh, trucks coming in versus leaving on I-10 versus 75. So I'll focus on I-10 first, uh, site 9949. In the uh, westbound direction, so leaving the state, there's about 28, 29% of all trucks class nine leaving the state were empty. Conversely, is about 17% of all trucks coming into the state were empty. On I-75, site 9956, leaving the state was about 48% empty, whereas coming into the state were about 11% empty. And then on I-95, site 9923, leaving the state was about 38% empty, I mean, into the state was about 13% empty. And the highest uh, number of uh, empty movements we found was uh, near Tampa on I-75 in the northbound direction, nearly 67%. And, uh, and drawing inferences from the data, there's a, a likelihood that there are distribution centers uh, along the I-4 corridor, along the I-75 corridor north of Tampa Bay Area where the movement of commodities coming into the Tampa Bay Area are full 
and then on that return trip back to the distribution centers north of town, um, that's that empty movement. And that similar kind of uh, empty movement is, is what we can see uh, elsewhere. Uh, Miami, Orlando, um, So then on slide 10, this is the number of full trucks. So uh, we found a larger percentage of truck, full trucks traveling into the state compared to leaving the state as predicted, uh, but we were actually able to quantify it, uh, and it is a validation of this trade imbalance that, that we had observed. So coming into the state on I-10, about 53% of trucks are full, whereas about 47% of trucks leaving the state are full. So that's fairly balanced. Uh, on I-75, uh, leaving the state, 30% of trucks are full, whereas coming into the state, 55% of trucks are full. And then on I-95, about 38% of the trucks leaving the state are full, whereas about 54% coming into the state are full. So pretty well balanced between 75 and 95 comparatively, uh, but we do see more exports leaving the state uh, in the Jacksonville area as compared to uh, the I-75 corridor. And we did a uh, similar analysis for the uh, cubed out trucks, and these make up nearly 20% of all truck traffic, so these numbers could essentially get lumped into the 20% or excuse me, the full truck category. Um, so roughly 20% of all those trucks out there uh, were in the cubed out category. And then lastly, the partially empty trucks make up about 10% of all trucks. So um, while it's not a one-to-one -one comparison with a truly empty truck, uh, this could kind of get lumped into the empty category. Um, it's only about 10% of all trucks, but between these and the empties, those are where we can try to start to steer policy and decision-making uh, to help to bring those numbers down. But th these are the trucks that um, might take advantage of uh, finding a, a payload in the backhaul direction as opposed to deciding to travel completely empty. And I might suggest uh, another inference from the data is that these would be uh, largely owner operators as opposed to national carriers, um, possibly. You know, we, we still need to dive into that, but um, some of those discussions are what we'd like to have with the greater audience to uh, identify really what's going on. Um, and then since we had per vehicle record for two and a half years, we also did a, a temporal analysis where we found that in the northbound direction uh, for the months between starting February through May, the number of empties leaving the state go down uh, by about 10%. And that would be um, commensurate with our agricultural and crop seasons uh, for goods leaving the state um, during those harvest times. So on slide 15, um, some of the factors that we Tanner, have... Tanner? Tanner? Yes. Yeah, yes. You, you didn't tell me to go ahead, so I, I, I'm just lit in 13 so they can see it. Okay. Now I'm in 14 so they can see time of day. And now I'm on 15. Yes, thank you for that, Bruce. So some of the factors that we see, uh, for our state anyway, uh, as reasons for empty movements um, leaving the state is that we're the third most populous state in the nation. Our geography is such that the peninsula cannot serve as a regional hub. Uh, we have um, a lot of visitors, uh, about 3 million per day, retirees, all leading to our economy being a, a largely a service sector economy, 
and we have largely a lack of manufacturing. A lot of the goods leaving the state are um, raw or agricultural, um, some in a uh, processed form, uh, but largely we don't export as much as compared to what we consume. So as expected, um, that, that is reflected in the numbers. So what we'd like to do next is really start um, on, on slide 16, start to look at this uh, from a more multimodal perspective. So to get some of the data uh, for the other modes, uh, primarily uh, seaport and rail, and comparing truck empty backhaul to uh, what we might observe uh, in these other modes to see how they complement and supplement or uh, contradict each other uh, so we can try to um, make best use of our available highway capacity um, with, and reduce those empty movements if, if we can at all. And then on slide 17, some of the potential solutions would be to attract more manufacturing industry, uh, consider a more Pony Express rather than full load, uh, kind of a shipment, uh, shipping strategy, uh, invest in projects facilitate, facilitating outbound uh, freight, um, and maybe some of these internet-based uh, freight efficiency applications, uh, empty miles, Uber freight, et cetera, could uh, help limit some of these empty movements uh, that we see. Additionally, especially from uh, port to a warehouse or distribution center, this idea of the collapsible cargo container might, might prove beneficial. And some other cost savings, such as uh, automated trucks for kind of a mid-long-term strategy or uh, driver-assisted truck platooning uh, might help to uh, limit some of these movements. Additionally, uh, we're in conversation with our motor carrier size and weight office uh, to institute a uh, green light program uh, where using a, a central hub of, of data and connecting all of our WIM stations across the state, uh, state, we might be able to permit a truck to bypass weigh stations if uh, at each WIM station it shows that it's empty. So instead of having to add time and, uh, to, and queues to our uh, inspection stations and our way stations, we might be able to let those trucks move quicker uh, out of the state or within the state. So some of the recommendations that came from this analysis uh, was to analyze uh, all freight modes uh, try to obtain industry data uh, to better understand the private sector perspective, gain some supply chain optimization. Additionally, within our WIM data, the data that we collect, um, bobtails hidden in Class 6 was one thing that is not part of this analysis since those Class 9 tractor uh, uh, cabs without the trailer uh, fall in Class 6. Um, these look like a dump truck to us in our wind data, so they're not considered an empty movement, even though they are, uh, when you consider a, a long-haul Class 9 uh, sleeper cab. So we'd also like to explore partnerships with our Agriculture Consumer Services, Department of Revenue, um, to identify a specific commodity that might be within trailers, uh, investigate our bill of lading data, um, see if that can uh, offer any insight as to which commodities uh, typically um, result in empty truck movements. For example, at our I-75 station near the, near the Florida-Georgia border, we got a, about a half day's worth of GoPro video, and we were doing a, a quick analysis of empty uh, trailers that we were seeing. And through observation, we noted, noticed that there were a significant movement of flatbed trailers coming into the state with construction trusses, so for uh, fabrication of buildings. Well, in the northbound direction, uh, there's a significant number of empty flatbeds. So that could tell us um, potentially that there's that freight imbalance 
where there might be um, some lumber yards in Georgia as per their timber industry bringing uh, prefab construction materials into the state. And so this is kind of all building up uh, to leverage our freight facilities data set that we're developing for our strategic intermodal systems office. Um, this truck taxonomy research uh, that I, I briefly mentioned is identifying potentially through uh, camera observations uh, what is moving empty um, and how a, potentially a, a vehicle inventory user survey for Florida could benefit um, a finer understanding of commodity movement in, in the state. So. Um, with that, uh, I'll uh, kind of pose the question that um, it might be interesting uh, to get other state data that we could analyze uh, and gain a southeast United States uh, picture of empty truck movements along the corridors, uh, as mentioned, uh, see what's happening from state to state. So if your state has uh, per vehicle record wind data, or uh, any wind data at all that we could evaluate if it'd be a, a suitable candidate for um, the Southeast uh, analysis, um, we would love to, to talk with you and see what kind of a corridor analysis we could do. Um, so Bruce, I'll, I'll end there with any questions or uh, any follow-up. Well, um, the first thing I want to mention is I, when I had the discussion with you and Joel and Ed uh, last week, there was mention of some of the other data programs that y'all are doing and an interest in having uh, another webinar um, on how you were doing some of this information to do business park analysis and clustering of, of tr truck traffic around business parks. So we'll, we'll go through all that when Joel and, uh, and Ed are back in the office. Does anybody have any other questions for this?